it's Christmas, and Christmas has become... Um, I never thought I'd live in a culture where Christmas was controversial, but it is. And I sure never thought Christmas would be as controversial with Christians as it is with the public. But it is. But you and I are over it. And uh, we're going to celebrate the, the, the birth of our Lord. What Christmas really is, is a time for the church to celebrate what God did in what's called the Incarnation. The idea that God became a man. We have two texts of scripture that attest to it really, really clearly. And uh, the first one is Matthew, and and it's here in chapter 1. And the second one is Luke in chapters 1 and 2. And it's there where these two gospel writers made it very, very plain that Jesus was born of Mary, but not of a of a human father, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. By the way, uh, one of the things that you should know as a a non-Catholic believer is that that the actual actual biblical teaching is virgin conception, not virgin birth. It's a fine distinction, but theologians make it and, um, and, 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 and consider it important. And as you'll see in the Matthew account of the passage, um, there's no sense in Matthew's account of, of Mary's virginity being maintained, but rather of her uh, going on and having a normal family. Now, that's a debate that's gone on for 500 years and before, and let's don't do that this morning because I have other debates to get into. <laughs> so, so if you have a Bible and you'll open it to Matthew 1, because well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the entire passage to you. And then we're going to walk through it as a, in a you're going to get a, a sermon, which is basically a commentary on Scripture. I'm a Bible preacher. As I was studying this passage, I just fell in love with the Scripture again. And I don't understand preachers who don't, who don't, use, who don't um, preach the Bible and use their, their personal information. Preach the Bible and use your stories. Uh, I, I really, I'm just completely flummoxed by people who want to preach their ideas and notions and stories and not the Bible. And uh, I I have lots of people that I love that that are that way, but man, the Bible is so rich and what it has to say and apply to us is so striking that I can't depart from it. Now, I have to confess, my first pastor was a man named Bill Baker. And I remember that he was um, accused of not telling enough stories and he said, I don't have time for stories, I have the Bible. And he was a wonderful teacher of the Bible. And um, while he sometimes got a little dusty, we preachers get dusty. I have a cure for that, and it is take a nap. (laughs) Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. By the way, somebody took a nap last night on the front row, and and I liked it. Because, look, it was really, it was, he was really, really tired and he wanted to be here. Both he was tired and he wanted to be here. And so he just laid down. And I thought it was cool. So, so you need to know that. that. Permission granted, Tommy. You can just, don't, don't, don't pass out. Just fall, just lay down. <laughs> Actually, it's Armstrong that needs that instructions. Armstrong listens, he can listen to sermons better asleep than any, most of you can awake. He can, he can tell me the mistakes I made without even being conscious. <laughs> Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, read that righteous man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken to the prophet, 
And he quotes Isaiah, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Don't you like that? By the way, the function of a father is to tell your children who they are. And this father listened to the heavenly father and was able to tell this son who he was. Your name is Jesus. You're God with us. You're here to save us. And we're going to dive into this passage and we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world today. And you're going to, listen, you know what? Here's what's going to happen this morning. You're going to get better. Because he's our glory and the lifter of our head. He's the one who encourages us. He's the one who gives us strength. He's the one who comes to us in our fear and tells us, don't be afraid and why we shouldn't be afraid. He's the one who saves us from our sins. He's the one who helps us when we are weak. He is the one who has come to you over and again and again. And because of him, we cannot be destroyed. Because of him, we cannot be overcome. And because of him, we live. We really live in Christ this morning. So, the first verse. Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way. King James says, on this wise. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, hallelujah. That's all right, I got it. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. All right. Man, the Holy Spirit gets left out of Christian life. But not here. Not in this church. I'm about to teach a course in systematic theology. And I found myself extremely frustrated because I, the, 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 the um, systematic theology books have to after, it's like they wedge in a chap on the Holy Spirit, their son and Holy Spirit. Luke 1 says it this way, And an angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So here's the account of Matthew and Luke. Uh, Matthew, um, as it comes from Joseph's point of view, and Luke, as it comes from Mary's point of view, this is, this is like, a, like a really good movie, telling the story from the different lenses. And I can tell you that this story was, was a problem. I, I love to imagine being there. I love to imagine first person experiencing it. And so we read this, now the birth of Jesus took place this way. When they were betrothed. Now, do you know that betrothal in the ancient world meant you were married? uh, Not in the ancient world, but in in the Jewish world of the first century. In the Jewish world of the first century, you got an engagement, and then you spent a year separated from one another, and then you came together and consummated the marriage. But legally, you were married when the betrothal was arranged. And usually a dowry would be paid, um, for, for the bride, and arrangements would be all made. And so this was, a, this was a very public thing. When you celebrated somebody getting engaged, it wasn't, you know, a, a secret photographer catching the moment. It was, it was, it was a very public declaration of our lives are going to be spent together. All the preparations were made in that first year, but there was no consummation of the marriage. And so he, they were betrothed. And, and it says, before they came together. She was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've been prepared for this as we looked at the genealogy of Jesus last week. Remember Tamar? She's found to be with child. And we don't know who the father is. And, of course, in that case, it was a big old scandal. And, of course, in that case, God still took the big old scandal and wove it into the story of our redemption. Because you can't make a mess so big, God can't work with it. You're just not that, you're just not that powerful. 
We can't make a mess that God can't fix. And, and man, that's, that's, that's some pretty good news there. But here's this story, shocking as it is. Now, in the, in the Matthew story, it takes your breath because you feel the scandal of it. In the Luke story, it quickly turns to joy and telling family members and prophetic words coming forth. But for Joseph, it had to be a dark night of the soul. And her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, that is, that is that word righteous that we've been talking about, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now this is, it's, it's really important. Like, how do you do that, right? Quiet divorce. Um, we, we, we get married secretly in this culture. We don't get divorced very secretly. <laughs> we, and... And this one, he said, what does it mean? Well, it actually has a context. It has a way that it actually worked out. Um, we can talk about our culture in a minute, but let me just tell you how this worked. I love the fact that in the previous verse, we're already told she's with child by the Holy Spirit. And in the next verse, we're told that Joseph didn't get the memo yet. Being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, he resolved to divorce her quietly. In the, in, the, in the world of the first century, there was two ways to get a divorce. One of them was a certificate or a document and two, and two witnesses. Simple thing. It's not a public mess. The second way involved getting your money back. Getting your dowry back. Finding the bride and the bride's family. Bringing an open disgrace. And Joseph says, no. We're not going that path. We're just going to deal with this quietly. Now, he's also called a righteous man. You remember how I've been defining righteousness? I've called righteousness the way someone who's in a covenant acts toward the person with whom they're in covenant. This is righteousness. By the way, notice this. He's called a righteous man when his intention is to divorce her because he's not disobeying either the law or the heart of God in this because it had all been revealed in Deuteronomy and you could look it up. I'll let you scramble after that one. It had been prescribed exactly how, how it was to be done in the covenant that Israel had. Now, God's about to intervene in this. And, and I think um, he's about to partner with Joseph's unwillingness to put her to shame. And listen, Joseph's about to partner with the shame. Meaning, Joseph will ultimately allow himself to be associated with what would be a scandal. And I've told you last week that John makes it very plain that Jesus' enemies knew the questions about his birth. And so when they were arguing with him, they said, you know, we weren't born of fornication. We're honorable people. Well, one of the fundamentals of the faith is what we call the virgin birth. And I'm going to... I'm going to talk about that, but um, I'm going to make a comment just on culture and us. I was born again in the midst of the, of the explosion of fundamentalism. Now, there's a difference in, that being, in believing in the fundamentals of the faith and being a fundamentalist. Believing in the fundamentals of the faith meant that you simply believed in the, in the cardinal doctrines of the church. The authority of, of, of Scripture, uh, the, the virgin birth of Christ as it's understood, the, the atoning death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, uh, the, the basic things about our faith that make us all one, whether we're, whether we're Catholic or charismatic or Protestant, the things about which we agree. But fundamentalism was a spirit that got into the church that turned the New Testament into a kind of a new law. And, and Christianity and Christian churches played gotcha all the time. 
You know, you know what I'm talking about? You, you get around a bunch of people and somebody catch you doing something. Well, what are you going to do about this verse? And then we'd have verse arguments. And, and it was a kind of a spirit that got all over us and it caused a whole generation of people to turn. And frankly, what we're having now is we're having the fruit of Christian fundamentalism, which is an, an, an enormous apostasy. Uh, the other thing fundamentalism did was it attempted to partner with the government to force people to be righteous according to our understandings. And it's been a, it's been a disaster. Um, I was no doubt a, a part of that. And the whole business of moral majority and all that stuff. Now, what we have now, do you, you guys know that we're living in the time of a great apostasy? Apostasy means falling away. I'm telling you, I remember when we had all kinds of people converting to Christ. Now we're reading about their children unconverting from Christ and doing so publicly. Some of them, after they go into public ministry, become pastors. It's an enormous thing. And what has happened is, it's very interesting, it's gotten hard to believe. During, during the 60s and 70s, one of the things I could tell you, it was much easier to believe than it is now. That is to say, that is to say, there was enough acceptance of the basic things of Christianity inside the culture that people were already convinced, as my son says, even if they weren't converted. In other words, people would tell you they believed the stuff about Jesus, whether they knew him or not, and that was my story. Lutheran background, uh, nobody, I would never argue with anybody about Jesus or that he was, that he was, that he died for us or was raised from the dead, but I didn't know him from a duck. <laughs> I didn't know him. I didn't, I didn't have a personal experience of him. And conversion in those days was moving from being convinced to being converted. Nowadays, I want to tell you something. One of the reasons it's so hard to see people converted is because they're not convinced already. The pre-evangelism is not done nowadays. Nowadays, you'll talk about stories like this and people say they don't believe it. Nowadays, you can pray for somebody to be healed. They get healed and they won't, they won't suddenly believe. They will say, how'd that happen? I have a lot of questions about how that happened. It's a really interesting time. Now, over the weekend, and, and my wife hates it when I do stuff like this, but I love her. <laughs> I became excited because I realized that there's a new fundamentalism rising. And I got excited about it. I think it's good. Now, why did I get excited about it when the old fundamentalism was so detrimental? Because the new fundamentalism is being practiced by the other guy. The new fundamentalism in America is the gotcha culture of politically correctness. Why? Because they're willing to shame you if you don't conform. Now, I'm excited about it because I know what it's going to end up in. It's going to end up with their children going, you guys need to breed. But before it does, it's going to get really wild and rocky. I, I sort of noticed this the other day when I saw when I saw this this magazine cover that was, that came out with with women uh, who were talking about the problems of what women had been going through, and it was like saying there's a there's a new day in town, and all of the PC people noticed that they were all white women. Oh my gosh, the horror, the vulgarity of it all. How could we do that? Anyway. These things, this is how life works, guys. This is how it really works. So, so what's happened now, what's happened now is the people who are using shame are up way on the left. Because I'm telling you what, you come with me to church, you're going to have to hunt up a shameful preacher that's trying to shame people these days. We're preaching grace and life and hope and forgiveness and inclusion. We've, we've been chastened with the whips of being fundamentalist, and now we've learned, hey, our gospel's better than we thought it was. And I'm planning on sticking with it. 
And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. And then God stepped in. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And I love this. How did this angel appear to him? In a dream. Oh my goodness. St. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, my Western mind is playing havoc with me. Wait a minute. Dude had a dream and decided that this pregnancy was okay. Like, listen, if you'd have said an angel showed up, that would have been one incredulous thing. But you said the angel showed up in a dream. I mean, is that even really an angel showing up? Is it your Western mind? Is it your windshield shattering at this thought? He had a dream and an angel appeared to him and called him the son of David and told him not to be afraid. And my goodness, it got to him. It worked. Um, my My fundamentalism is all offended also. Because before about 1997... If you'd have told me you were getting directions from your dreams, I would have told you you were practicing New Age religion or witchcraft or something. I would have told, I would have said, what is wrong with you? Because because I would, I I never would, I'd say, no, you don't get directions from the dreams, you get your directions from the Word of God. And they said, well, we did. Everybody in the Bible got their direction from dreams. I mean, you look it up, man. You you do yourself a Bible study. (laughs) Apparently, God has a harder time getting our attention when we're awake. (laughs) Somebody's going to say, and the Lord appeared to me on my screen, (laughs) in my pocket. (laughs) Listen, listen. Does God talk today? This is one of the big deals. Is God talk today? Is God talking to you? Does anybody like need to hear from God? I'm telling you, here's a man who needed to hear from God. You're getting married, she's pregnant. You know you haven't touched her. Where's this coming from? He needs to hear from God. Man, you need to hear from God today. I'm struggling with something right now, and I, and I need to hear from God. And uh, let me tell you how we are. I come to church today, and I'm like, where is my church? Because y'all have been coming to church here. You know, we, we, there's a bunch of us. And so I come in today and I'm like, hmm, is God with me? But I don't live by that stuff. I've been at this a long time. I don't live by that stuff. I want you to go see your mama for Christmas. I'm mad half the time because I can't go see mine. I don't live by that stuff. I live by the Word of God. And listen, the Word of God can come to me in his Holy Scripture, but I have Holy Spirit living within me. The Word of God can come to me there too. Now, I even used to get any direction from dreams, but things have changed. So sometimes I, I, I ask now, I ask, used to ask, okay, how many of I used, I used, I've asked you before, how many of you have been healed as a direct result of prayer? Now let me just blaspheme all over the place. How many of you have found out what to do in your life through a dream? Let me see some hands. Burn them, burn them, they're heretics. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, this doesn't mean that, that, listen, I have some cockamamie dreams. I don't wake up and say that. Do you? I don't know about you, but I'm like this. It, I, kind of, I kind of have a filter in me because I, I soak myself enough in Scripture and truth and, and wisdom and good good people. I kind of have a filter in me. Sometimes I know that I just drank, I just, I just dreamed because of the, the, the bad sausage I ate today. <laughs> or the, the chili being too much chili. And usually, you know, I wake up and I go, whoo, thank you Jesus that that wasn't real. Right? But what happens to me is when God's wanting to get my attention, I'll have one of those dreams where I wake up and go, oh. And I know, listen, the dream people in the church, they'll all tell you, 
Listen, sleep with a notebook by your bed. If I wrote the stuff that I dreamed about when I wake up in the middle of the night, if I stopped and wrote, I would not get another wink of sleep the rest of the night. So I usually say, Lord, if that's you, I'm going back to sleep. Let me know. So you, I don't care how you catch your dreams. You can sleep with a butterfly net if you want to. And can, I don't care what you do. It's, most of the times when I have a dream and it's the Lord, I know it. I do know it. And if you're a seeker of the Lord, can I tell you something? He knows how to get hold of you. One of the reasons that people don't hear from God, the main reason people don't hear from God today is they're not tuned in. Not tuned in. And this is one of the things I worry about in the culture. Because listen, back, back in the 60s and 70s when there was a revival sweeping the land, people were tuned in. And in general in culture, people were interested in the things of God. Nowadays, people are tuning out. And the culture is asking you to tune out. And listen, even the politically correct culture is helping you to tune out of the things of God and pressing you and pushing you to not listen to God. And so now it's like hard to listen to God because we'll hear something and we'll go, well, I don't know if that was God or not because we're so living with doubts. I'm glad Joseph was already a man fixed as a man who wanted to do what was right. He was a righteous man. He had his heart set on, I'm going to do what's right. Now I'm going to tell you something. If you set your heart on doing in your life what God wants you to do, and on fulfilling your destiny. I want you to know He knows how to find you. My friends at Irish Ministry have a basic value that says God can be found. Because it's based on if you seek Him, you will find Him. And that's their very first value, God can be found. But I want to tell you, God can find you. And when, and when God is found, you will always say, He found me. You will always know that he did something. God intervened with Joseph, and he did something big, man. He found him. Hallelujah. Last night, I, I got through this so easy. As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, and now listen, son of David. Son of David. This was, the, this was the magic word, if you will. Son of David. Joseph, let me remind you who you are. You're not just any old Joe. You're a son of David. If you're a son of David and an Israelite, you knew that your family had ancient promises on it. You knew it. You knew that your family had a destiny. And you knew that you were living in times when people were looking for and expecting that destiny to be fulfilled. Son of David, do not be afraid. I think we can say this is the first command. The first command in the Gospel of Matthew. Don't be afraid. Anybody need that word? I'm an old man walking with Jesus a long time now, 45 years I've been walking with Jesus, and I notice that I still get afraid when the circumstances of life are a mess. I notice I still get afraid when I know that I've compromised myself. Now, I'm a pretty clever fellow. Most of my compromises happen inside here, not outside here, because I've learned to sin with sophistication. But I get afraid when I get found out about my stupidity. I get afraid. And so even this week I found there were moments in my life when I was afraid. And I was studying this text and I kept reading, don't be afraid. Man, you know, we, if you read your newspaper, you're going to be a lot afraid. Put that thing down. Newspaper is just giving you more information than you can handle. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived of her 
is from the Holy Spirit. I, I Even when I hear that, I go, I don't know about you, but I would have said, what the heck does that mean? The Holy Spirit got my betrothed pregnant. Anyway, I'm still working on that one. <laughs> she will bear a son. Now this is, by the way, before you could find that out beforehand. This is a Holy Spirit sonogram. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Anybody interested in that one? Let me tell you, quit denying your sins and just get saved from them. Quit justifying them and just get saved. When I got saved, Jesus forgave me of what I did. What if now he's, he's forgiven me of what I do. And, I, and, and he, he's going he's gonna to forgive me so much. I'm going to be so forgiven and so saved from my sins that when it's all said and done, I'm going to look like him. That's what he says. I'm going to bear his image. I'm going to look just like him. Now, in the Greek, the word for Jesus is Jesus. And in the Hebrew, the word is Joshua, Yeshua. Now, our New Testament is written in Greek, and what you and I have done is we've anglicized the Greek word, transliterated it into our language, and we call his name Jesus. If, if, you, were, if you were in Greece today, today, you would use the word Jesus. And, and Jesus' name is pronounced differently all over the world. And a lot of people get all in a twist because we don't pronounce his name um, according to Yeshua, or if you would, Joshua, which is the anglicized version of that. So if your name is Joshua, your, your Greek name is Jesus. <laughs> just, just tell it. Now, can I tell you something? In any language, in any translation... People can get saved and delivered from their demons by his name, however it's pronounced. I've noticed this everywhere I've gone. I hear people calling on Isa and getting saved. I hear them calling on his name in many languages and getting saved. And I see demons skedaddle when his name is said no matter how it's said. Have y'all ever seen a demon skedaddle? That's where I'm from, that's what they do. She will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now he's about to be given another name. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Now, take note of that little phrase in Matthew, because Matthew is going to use this phrase five times in the next couple of chapters. And five times, Matthew is going to call on Old Testament um, passages, and by the way, in unique ways, in ways that other people historically had not done so before him. What's going on with Matthew, just so you'll know, and everything that's going on in this first chapter of Matthew is that Matthew is far enough past these events that he's seen the questions people are asking and he's answering them before they come up. With, by the way, very few words. The biblical economy of words is, is amazing. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then he says, which means God with us. All right. Now that is a well-known passage to you. That is a passage that's taken out of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. But what's not known to most people it's like the context of the thing, and I exist to ruin your world with many words of context. <laughs> Having gotten it, to get it. These words harken back to the time of King Ahaz. If you don't know who King Ahaz was, look back in the genealogy of Jesus, and you'll see he's there. 
you'll see that between David and the deportation to Babylon, there's old Ahaz. And just so you'll know, Ahaz was no righteous man and no righteous king. He was an ungodly man. And even though he lived in a godly line that would bring forth the Savior of the world, he didn't give a fig about it. He cared about himself and lived for himself. And, and uh, he didn't even understand or know his own de destiny or inheritance. And so what happened is while Ahaz was the king, his enemies made alliances. And, and have you noticed that enemies are still making alliances? Like, I'm going to get in trouble. My wife is begging me on the front row. I'm going to get in trouble. So I won't do it. All I was going to do was talk against cowboys. <laughs> no. Ahaz's enemies to the north, Syria, and the northern tribes that had broken away from the divided nation of Israel had made an alliance and they were coming against Ahaz and Ahaz was quaking because he knew he could not withstand these enemies. Ahaz needs a word from God. So God says to Ahaz, Hey, Ahaz, ask me for a sign. I have some friends that are sign seekers. I, I, I'm, I'm not much of a sign seeker. I can read signs. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do much of, much of that. I, I, I'm weird, but I have some friends that just, they just look for signs. I, I found about myself that if I look for signs, I usually will find something that validates what I'm after. Are you like that? Um, any, anyway, God told Ahaz, ask me for a sign. Make it as big as you want. And Ahaz says, oh, I would never do such a thing. He was righteous like me. So. <laughs> I would, he says, no, I would never do that. Which is, it's just hilarious because he's the worst dude on the planet. <laughs> and, and God says, ask for a sign. He says he won't do it. And God says, okay, I'll just give you one. A young maiden shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name God with us. In other words, God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let a baby be born, and the birth of that baby will let you know that I'm with you. Now, immediately, people go, well, who was that baby? Was it Hezekiah, the, his, own, his own immediate child? Who was it? Um, I, I actually think that it was probably, it probably in this immediate application, ended up simply being Isaiah's own child who has an interesting name. But what it means is a child has to be born and grow up. In other words, this child is going to be an indication that God is with us. Meaning, your enemies may be coming, but they're not coming next week. They're not coming next week. Now, ultimately, this sign is a sign that pointed towards Ahaz's own offspring because Ahaz also was a son of David, though he had not walked in that spirit and was not walking in that spirit. He was walking in the spirit of unbelief. He was walking in the spirit of ungodliness. Ultimately, the application would be to his great great, 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 great grandson, coming one. But in the immediate, it meant, no, not today. Well, hmm, you didn't change my slides. I forgot to remind you. Hallelujah. Y'all want me to stick with his version or mine? His is shorter. Hang in there. In my version, we go now to, to Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And listen what it says. And the government will be on his shoulder. 
And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Listen, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it for now and forevermore. What you have to get to understand this text, what you have to get is who he was. And now what you have to get and what I have to get is who we are. Who are we? All of them were looking for one to come upon whom his shoulders the government would be. You and I are looking back on one. And we're saying, really? If I tell you that one has come and the government is on his shoulders, your tendency will be to read your newspaper and say, no, it don't look that way. It don't look that way. It never has and it never will until the thing is consummated completely. It never did. It usually doesn't. But here's what you and I do. You and I live as if it's so. Meaning that like like old Joseph, uh, the son of David, you and I learn to live without fear. But why do we do it? Because God is with us. How do we know He's with us? Because He showed up. Because all the things that were told uh, to to, uh, Joseph, all the things that were told beyond him to Ahaz, all those things got consummated in a son born in Bethlehem. All those things came to pass and got consummated in him. And you and I saw him. We beheld him. Not with our own eyes, but we have beheld him through the eyes of his eyewitnesses. Through the ones who have testified, the ones who are testifying to to us of him now. We all know him. And then what we know is that this son, who by the way, it was a son. And he was named Jesus. And what he represented is that God is with us. Can you believe that today? Because what I need to know, I'm like, it's cool that Joseph got that word. I need it. You need it. We need the word that God is with us. So I'm going to show you something that's interesting, fascinating. In Matthew chapter 28, okay, we were just in Matthew chapter 1. Now we're in Matthew chapter 28. Those of you who are from Baptist backgrounds, this is like the first verse of the Bible, not the last verse of Matthew. And Jesus came and said to them, now let's set context. This is after he was crucified. This is after he was raised from the dead. And this is him coming to his disciples. And he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You know what that means? It means the government is on his shoulders. What do we do with that? He says, pay attention. Go therefore make disciples of all nations. Can you hear the echo of Genesis 1, of Matthew chapter 1? The Moabites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, all of those people who slipped into the genealogy of Jesus. Make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, what? I am with you always. To the end of the age. Matthew's gospel starts by introducing us to one who will save us, who is called Emmanuel, and ends by by telling us about one who's in charge of everything, who is named Emmanuel. God is with us. Yeah, it's great that he was with Joseph, but it's way cooler for me that he's with me. I'm just like that, aren't you? He's with us. And his government is not conquering the kingdoms of the world. It's making disciples of all nations. How is it done? Well, the Bible says it's done 
by the foolishness of preaching, somebody proclaims Jesus and people go, I think that's true. And when they say, I think that's true, when, you, know what they, you know what happens? They get baptized. We just had a baptism. Orly, can I refer to you? Can I do it? You don't mind? Man, you blessed me so much the other day. He got baptized. You know what he said? I'm getting baptized because I'm not an orphan anymore. You know what that means? That means identity. Identity. That means Jesus gives you an identity. He tells you who you are. You are a much beloved son in a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, in a kingdom that cannot end. And the word that he has is, I'm with you, Orly. I'm with you. That's what the Lord says to you this morning. That's what he says to you this morning. I'm with you. Go make some disciples. I'm with you. Michael Porter, you can do what's in your heart to do. God says, I'm with you. You're on target. You're on task. You're in the mission. Go get her done. Walk it out. See God, his, see his mission being fulfilled in your life. See his glory coming true in your life. Because I'm with you. Now listen, it didn't just mean... Now, he said, I like it. He said, I'm Emmanuel always. Always. One of the things that I loved about my Baptist days was if there's anything a Baptist understood, it's he's with us. I think I understand a few more things about how he's with us. He's with us in the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that overshadowed Mary and got this thing started comes upon us and births it through us. Here and now. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but freely but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Romans chapter 8. And then finally, we finish with Matthew. When Joseph woke from sleep. Wake up, O sleeper. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He woke up from that dream and said, Mary, the Lord has spoken to you. Can you imagine the reunion those two had as their relationship shifted back from suspicion to devotion? (laughs) And took his wife, but he knew her not until she had been given, given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Would you stand together? First, I have have two words and then probably three. Word number one. Don't be afraid. Because God's with you. So I just want to just, so before any explanation, any more explanation, if you've been hit with fear, would you come forward and let us pray for you? Just come on. We're we're an open church. We come, we pray for one another. Come on, man. That's right. If you've been hit with fear, come on, let us pray for you. This is a house of prayer. Fear will not rule or ruin or control your life. Fear is not your master. Fear is not the voice that, that, that controls you in any way. If you've been hit with fear, all right.
you call, you guys all know when I leave because you'll walk outside and you'll be written in the sky. Because that's what, that's what God's going to have to do to me. Get me out of here. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're dealing with something and you don't know if the Lord is with you or not, would you come? Join these, join these little guys. If you're dealing with something and I, don't, I just don't know if God's with me, I don't know. I, I, I got I to gotta get a clear word. I know I'm standing in that place. Is it, there you go. Come on, people. Anybody else? I don't know if he's with me. I just don't know. Okay, I need a lot of ministry team. Come on. Come, come be with these because I'll go to the third thing. Come on, prayer team. Come on. Pray, pray with these. Ladies, men, come, let's pray. I need some men over here. Guys, I see y'all don't I see somebody there too. And then when you turn your back, I need one over here. Yeah, come on. Then the most important thing of all, I always remember it was a Christmas Eve when my heart began to open afresh to Jesus when I was 17 years old. And I was at a service on a Christmas Eve. And I had been running away from God. And I was standing in that old Lutheran service with the iconography all over the place and the stained glass windows and the candles lit and and I heard the voice of the Lord calling me and I heard him saying to me I still want you I still want you and that set me on a path for the next eight months that led me to be gloriously converted moving from being convinced to converted and in the Bible it says today, if you hear his voice, don't get a hard heart. I'm so glad I didn't get a hard heart. I'm so glad I lived inside the mystery of God's voice. If you hear God calling you and he's saying, I still want you. I still want you. For me, it was a call for me to confess the Jesus that I knew about as my Lord and to be baptized and to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. You can come forward and indicate that desire in your life as well. And while we're praying and while we're ministering, if you just quietly come forward, we will pray for you. Others of you, or like just, just maybe, I don't know, maybe the process is getting started. Because I know when, when it's Christmas Eve, I see, I see and I don't know everybody. I, like I know everybody at other times, and I don't know everybody. So I don't know what God's saying to you. But I'm telling you, if you think you hear God calling you, what you should do is say, Lord, is that really you? Because if you're calling me, I'm going to listen. Now let me bless you. I'm letting you out early because you're going to come back early. Five o'clock, communion service, candlelight service. Um, Pastor Chuck may have some things, but I'm going to speak the blessing and then I'm going I'm to let you be released. May the Lord bless us and keep us and make his face shine on us. May the Lord be gracious, that is, give us his favor. May he lift up his countenance on us and give us peace. The peace that does not ever pass away. In the name of Jesus, even Yeshua. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you for being here. Be blessed as you go and receive.